Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I, your host Amy Walker, delve into stories from across history with a guest who has no idea what the topic is going to be. Joining us for this episode is Han Birch. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, doing good. It's It's been a while since we recorded because I decided to, to take a break. So <laughs> um, even though the listeners will think, well, she was just on the last episode, it's been about a month and a half since yeah, we've recorded it was, together. It was um, the Ron Hubbard one was the last time one we did, wasn't it? No, uh, Sydney Riley, Super Spy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Well, you'll have to listen to that one when it comes out. I listen to them all when they come out. Good. That's what I like to hear. Not that I'm pressuring people, but... So, oh, I don't know what happened then. My brain just switched off. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great start to the show. Did you did you forget we were recording? Did you just think we were having a conversation? I, I don't know. My, my I just sort of went, nope, and phased out for a second. To make the listeners aware, I was saying to you before the recording hand, this is actually... A topic that was wasn't actually geared towards you when I researched it. Um, it was for another recording that fell through, so it's going to be interesting to see how you react to this one because I try and normally gear my topics towards each guest. Uh, I try and find the things that interest them and and tailor them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to like this one. Come well, the I end. Hope, well, I hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> I'm well. I'm more worried about disappointing you. <laughs> <laughs> After after so long away, you come back and it's like, oh yeah, this is going to be great. And then you get this topic and it's like, well, that was fucking horrible, Amy. Thank you. I'm a nerd. I like learning new things, even if they traumatise me. Good, good. I don't think it's too traumatic, this one. it I'm not going to say anything, actually, because a- anything I say could be spoilerific. So mm-hmm. I think we should just get into it and, and see how you go on with this one. Absolutely. This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. In 1950, it was estimated that there were no more than 20,000 non-white residents in the entirety of the United Kingdom, and almost all of them were born overseas. Just after the end of World War II, the first group of post-war Caribbean immigrants started to emigrate and settle in London. I was going to, I was, because I, I knew that there'd been a big wave of um, Caribbean immigrants, but I wasn't sure when that was. Yeah, it was um, following World War Two. because from what I understand about this, and I, I don't know a huge amount of this, it's something I do want to look into, but a lot of non-white service personnel came over to mm. the UK during the war. And I know particularly with the American black personnel, they were treated a hell of a lot better here than in America. So I think a lot of people came to the UK following World War Two because yeah, they yeah, saw it as a, a good place to come and get a, a new start in life and help. For, for us as well, it was help to rebuild the country after the devastation of the war and everything like that. So it was seen as a very much a, a, a benefit to, to both groups. Mm. I know that when the American um, GIs came over, that um, the British refused to uh, segregate segregate their pubs they were requested to provide yeah. different different pubs and they went no yeah pretty much most landlords just turn around and like i'll serve who i want thanks and we're not racist we're i'd classic. rather yeah I'd, I'd rather have people who've come here to help fight for my country drinking my pub than people like you yeah so, although yeah. although we're going to be i mean we're going to be taking this all back because i know that a lot of the uh black immigrants were treated appallingly by British people yeah. when they came over. It, here, so. it went it went downhill, but initially it was seen as a, a you know people went into it with high hopes on both sides that this was going to be a good thing. But yeah, as you say, things don't always work out, especially when it comes to race and white people being involved. Mm-hmm. There were an estimated five hundred immigrants that were passengers on the HMT Empire Windrush that arrived at Tilbury Docks on the twenty second of June, 
1948, the first of a series of migrants from the Caribbean that would become known as the Windrush Generation. See, I didn't know that one was named after the ship. I'd heard the term, I, I, but... Uh, I'd heard the term, but I didn't know it was named after the ship. Yeah, because I always thought, why is it called that? But there we go. From the 1950s into the 1960s, there was a mass migration of workers from all over the English-speaking Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, who settled in the UK. These immigrants were invited to fill labour requirements in London's hospitals, transportation venues and railway development. There was a continuous influx of African students, sportsmen and businessmen mixed within British society. They were widely viewed as having been a major contributing factor to the rebuilding of post-war urban London's economy. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. Over a quarter of a million West Indians, the overwhelming majority of them Jamaican, settled in Britain in less than one decade. So that's a big influx in a short time. Yeah, that's a big influx. So 20,000 in the entirety of the UK to a quarter of a million million. in 10 years, most of which centred around London. Mm. In 1961, the black British population was estimated at 191,600 just under 0.4% of the total UK population. The 1962 Commonwealth Immigration Act was passed in Britain along with a succession of other laws which severely restricted the entry of black immigrants into Britain. During this period, it was widely argued that emergent blacks and Asians struggled in Britain against racism and prejudice. So there you go, six paragraphs here and racism and prejudice turns up, so, so you're spot so, on. Yeah, so they, <laughs> they started coming in 1948 and everyone was like, yay, but then within 10 years, everyone was like, mm. Yep, uh, it lasted longer than I thought. Mm. Due to the large influx of migrants into the London area, new housing became a priority. And in 1967, construction of the Broadwater Farm Estate began in Tottenham. The estate contained 1,063 flats providing homes for three to 4,000 people. The design of the estate was characterised by large concrete blocks and tall towers. Sorry, whereabouts was this in London? Tottenham. Right. Because of a high water table in the area and the risk of flood caused by the Mosel River, I think I pronounced that right, which flows through the site, no housing was built on ground level. Instead, the ground level was entirely given over to car parking. The buildings were linked by a system of interconnected walkways at first floor level known as the deck level. Shops and amenities were also located on the deck. Oh, yeah, this is this, like, absolute nightmare housing estate that they built and then they found it completely impossible to police um, because people could just, like, go into buildings, run up and then, like, run across the deck and go into different buildings and... Mm -hmm. It's like, it sounds, on paper, a good idea. Everything's interconnected, it's easy to get around, but, yeah, when it comes to trying to police it, it does cause a few issues. Mm. The 12 interconnected buildings were each named after a different World War II RAF aerodrome, including Croydon and Debden. The most conspicuous buildings are the very tall North Holt and Kenley Towers, and the large ziggurat-shaped Tanmere Block. By 1973, problems with the estate were becoming apparent. The walkways of the deck level created dangerously isolated areas which became hotspots for crime and robbery and provided easy escape routes for criminals. So you beat me to that one. Thanks. I think there was also I think there was also a big deal because the um they didn't like maintain it or, at all, so it sort of like got shitty really quickly. Yep, that is correct because the next sentence is the housing was poorly maintained by the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. This is one of those You're allowed I to no, know certain I, I things. I have no idea how I know about this this estate, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> It suffered badly from water leakages, pest infestations, including a serious outbreak of cockroaches and electrical faults. More than half of the people offered accommodation in the estate refused it, and the majority of existing residents had applied to be rehoused elsewhere. So no one wants to be there. Mm -hmm. In 1976, less than 10 years after the estate opened, the Department of the Environment concluded that the estate was so poor that it needed to be demolished. (laughs) 10 years? Ten years. And I bet that they blamed the residents rather than <laughs> more like More than likely, yeah. yeah. While residents objected to conditions, some also opposed the demolition plan. Relations between the community and the local authority became increasingly confrontational. A process of redevelopment began in 1981, but it was hampered by a lack of funds and an increasingly negative public perception of the area. In 1985, Alice Coleman, a professor of geography at King's College London, published a critique of 1960s housing estates entitled Utopia on Trial. 
The book claimed that there were lapses of civilised behaviour in these estates. She claimed that residents were far more likely to commit and to be the victims of antisocial behaviour. Although the book didn't mention Broadwater Farm by name, by the time it was published, the estate was becoming synonymous with this type of housing. The government began to put pressure on Haringey London Borough Council to improve the area. Um, I can't, I can't remember who it was, but it seems it um, there was a um, an American um, guy who did this really horrific experiment on rats to try and prove that, um, like, when you put urban populations it was it was racist science basically he was trying to prove that when you put black populations together um they degrade themselves and they basically they they create their own sink culture which 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 creates mm. their own minds spoiler alert people and and yeah when you do it to rats they do do that but you know people aren't rat, um, rats yeah <laughs> more likely to do with the fact that you know the local authorities aren't maintaining their properties and that then yeah it, it was very much, you can't blame the authorities, it's the people who live there, and because they happen to be black societies, it's the blacks' fault, was basically yeah. the way mm. of thinking, yeah. Which, yeah, it would be great if that was just a, a small view, but uh, quite a lot of people do take that view of, if certain demographics live in this area, the area will go bad. Yeah, whereas it's actually, it's when you look at sort of like the social policies of governments over the last 70 years, the reason that black urban populations are synonymous with crime and, and things is because the white governments have made it so, mm. have, have made sure that for generations they, are, they, they have been treated poorly. Yeah. Although the demographics of Broadwater Farm at the time were roughly 50% black and 50% white, the Tenants Association was all white. <laughs> it was regarded with increasing distrust by black residents and those whites who were not connected with the association. In 1981, residents set up the rival Youth Association. It was praised by many members of the local black community for challenging the special patrol group's perceived harassment of local youths and black residents. Unfortunately, black citizens across the UK had been increasingly targeted by police forces since the 1950s. During the 1970s, police forces across England increasingly began to use the Sus Law, which allowed them to stop and search people, provoking a sense that the young black men were being discriminated against by the police. Oh shit, we had stop and frisk here! I did not know that. Yep, yeah. It, it, um, thankfully, it's, it's not around anymore, as far as no. I'm aware, but yeah. Um... And it does seem to have been brought into play to at the period when black populations were on the increase, so make of that what you will. Numerous riots between the police and black citizens occurred. In 1976, at the Notting Hill Carnival and the St Paul's riots in Bristol, tensions were further inflamed when police launched Operation Swamp 81, a series of mass stop and searches of young black men. And they called it Swamp. Yep, Swamp 81. They, they love these awful names. Mm -hmm. Anger erupted when up to 500 people were involved in street fighting between the Metropolitan Police and local Afro-Caribbean community, leading to a number of cars and shops set on fire, stones thrown at police, and hundreds of arrests and minor injuries. So that's the kind of climate at the time for mm -hmm. these kind of um, situations. I wonder. I wonder why. Well, I don't. I don't really wonder. I don't do. Do I really? <laughs> Sorry. I was just. I was just sort of like pondering about the the um the through line of um racist and and copper but it's it's the militaristic toxic masculinity it's all that bullshit wrapped into one isn't it mm, yeah in 1983 the council gave broadwater farm tenants association an empty shop to use as an office and a vague authority to quote deal with local problems <laughs> this apparent favoritism heightened antagonism between the Tenants Association and the Youth Association, which in turn set up its own youth club, advice centre, a state watchdog, and local lobbying group. So it's a very clear divide between the council-favoured group and the one mm -hmm. that's actually doing stuff for the locals. Yeah. And guess which one is all white? <laughs> um, well, I don't like to be stereotypical, but... <laughs> Despite the lack of funds and unwillingness on the part of the council to commit to, re to commit to regeneration, by 1985 progress was made in solving the area's problems. Pressure from the Tenants Association and the Youth Association forced the council to open a neighbourhood office. In 1983, a tenants empowerment agency, 
Priority Estates Projects was appointed to coordinate residents' complaints and concerns. Residents were included on interview panels for council staff dealing with the estate. A number of initiatives aimed at providing activities for disaffected local youths and at integrating the mixture of ethnic communities in the area appear to be succeeding. Sir George Young, then Minister for Inner Cities, secured significant funding for improvements. Broadwater Farm began to be seen as a case study in regeneration on regenerating a failing housing development. Cool. Yeah, so they're starting to turn it around. But who gets the credit? (laughs) Oh, we know who. It'd be the council, of course. Yeah. Princess Diana paid a visit to the estate in February 1985 to commend the improvements being made, but much of the apparent progress was superficial. The problems caused by the deck-level walkways had not been solved. Children from Broadwater Farm were still underachieving academically in comparison to the surrounding areas. The unemployment rate stood at 42%, and there was a mutual distrust between the local residents, particularly those from Afro-Caribbean community, and the predominantly white British and non-local police officers. So are they... Sorry, I, w- I wonder if... if um, I don't know how much detail you have on this, or whether they did the whole sort of, like, broken windows bullshit, where they do, like, slap some paint around and, and do surface-level improvements, but don't actually um, focus on any meaningful changes to change people's lives. Yeah, it, it does seem to be... For all appearances, we're doing well, you know, we're improving the way the place looks, we're including local residents in these interview boards and stuff, but they're not addressing the underlying cause for a lot of these problems, so it is it, it's, it's sticking a plaster on something. Mm. You know, eventually it's, it's not going to hold back everything, and unless they deal with the root cause, it's, it's not going to work. Yeah. And then the fact that there's so much animosity between residents and local authorities and police forces, it doesn't help either. No. On the 5th of October, 1985, a young black man, Floyd Jarrett, who lived about a mile from Broadwater Farm, was arrested by police, having been stopped in a vehicle with an allegedly suspicious car tax disc. He was taken to nearby Tottenham Police Station and charged with theft and assault, but but was later acquitted of both charges. Five and a half hours later, DC, Randall and three other officers decided to search his mother's home. The police, without a search warrant, let themselves into the house using using Floyd's keys, without knocking or announcing themselves, while his mother and her family were watching television. Go on. During the search, 49-year-old Cynthia Jarrett collapsed and died from a heart attack. During the coroner's inquest into her death, her daughter Patricia claimed to have seen DC Randall push her mother whilst conducting the search inside their house, causing her to fall. Ugh. Randall denied this allegation. So, yeah, they just entered a home to search without any warrant or authority. Or even knocking or on the fucking door. Yep. And you wonder why there's so much animosity between police and minority communities. Yeah. Cynthia Jarrett's death, unsurprisingly, sparked outrage from the black community against the conduct of the Metropolitan Police. There was a widespread belief that the police were institutionally racist. (laughs) Sorry, it's not an article of faith, it's a fucking fact. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) but they don't have to convince themselves that they know that, they have to convince the other white people of that. And that's not going to happen. Especially back in the 80s, people still pretty much trusted the police. True. And also, with what what is it was like 0.4% of the population, so the chances of the average person even knowing a black person yeah. are remotely, you know. Oh, yeah. My, my granddad was in his 30s before he ever saw a black person. Mm. There, was, there was one... It's like, yeah. <laughs> there was one black person in my year at school. Yeah. And... Same. He was... In, and he was adopted. Wow. Yeah. Another black woman... Cheryl Gross, had been shot by police a week earlier in Brixton while they searched her home looking for her son, Michael, who was wanted of, on suspicion of robbery and firearms offences. What? Mm-hmm. And four years earlier, the Scarman report into the 1981 Brixton riots criticised police. So this isn't an inc- isolated incident. No. In particular, the local council leader, Bernie Grant, later condemned the search and urged the local police chiefs to resign immediately as their behaviour had been, quote, out of control. Just a side note. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the um, scene from the young ones that they cut out? Um, you can still find it on YouTube. Yeah, the, the, the white man's electricity. Yeah. Yeah. 
who mistakes someone for a black guy because they're wearing black gloves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, which I think should still stand because it because it's a it's a satire. Well, no, it's not. I mean, it's not. It, it's it's yeah. It's a satire of an actual problem. Yeah, that's the thing. Like they, that's the the writers and creators of the young ones turn around being like, no, we can see that this is an issue, mm-hmm. and this is something that's not good. And the only way we can address that is by putting it into our comedy show. Yeah. But it, yeah, it never got aired, which is a shame because. No, I think it was. I think it was aired at the time, but it was cut. Oh, it's been subsequently. Yeah, I, I think it's been subsequently right. cut. But it, it, it really baffles me because like, you know, some things that they've some things they've cut out of BBC shows and some things they haven't. Mm. Anyway, carry on. Protesters began to gather outside Tottenham Police Station, a few hundred yards from Broadwater Farm, around one thirty AM on Sunday morning on the sixth of October. Four of the station's windows were smashed, but the Jarrett family asked that the crowd disperse. Later that day, two police officers were attacked with bricks and paving stones at Broadwater Farm, and a police inspector was attacked in his car. The next few hours saw some of the most violent rioting the country had ever experienced. By early evening, a crowd of 500 mostly young black men had gathered on the estate, setting fire to cars, throwing petrol bombs and bricks, and dropping concrete blocks and paving stones from the estate's outdoor walkways, knocking several police officers unconscious. Which is another reason why they shouldn't have those raised walkways. (laughs) Mm -hmm. The local council's community relations officer said there was a shifting convoy of ambulances. As soon as one was loaded up with injured officers, another would move up to take its place. Four senior officers were in control of the police deployment in the area that night. Chief Superintendent Colin Couch, Chief Superintendent David French, Superintendent William Sinclair and Chief Inspector John Hambleton. Over the course of the riot, at least 30 shots were fired from three firearms. The first time shots had been fired by rioters in Britain. That's ever. And it was definitely the rioters, not the cops. Yeah, from what I could see, they didn't send firearms officers in. It was just the standard riot police, so in theory it couldn't be from cops. But I'm going to be honest, I don't trust the police accounts on this. And there's reasons why at the end of the story you'll see why I don't trust any police accounts well, on I mean, this whole I mean... incident. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the illegal firearms market was like in the 1980s in central London, Mm. but it seems like, you know, even now, guns aren't common. No. Even amongst, you know, even in gang culture in this country, it's nice crime. It's not not so much gun crime. And that's what, 30 years later? Mm. Anyway. Well, this next bit goes into to answer a bit more, because later that evening at uh, 9.45 p.m., Uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Kenneth Newman authorised the deployment of specialist police armed with plastic bullets and CS gas to be used as a last resort should all else fail. So it's, um, those are the only firearms they had and incidentally it was also the first use of plastic bullets during a riot in Britain. Oh wow. So there's a lot of firsts for this riot. (laughs) It's it's a noteworthy one. The unit arrived at 10.20 but the senior officers at the estate refused to use them. So they were never actually sent in. Mm Mm-hmm. The rioting continued until the early hours of the morning. By the end of the night, 250 police officers were injured, two policemen and three journalists had suffered gunshot wounds. Oh, okay, so there were people who were shot. That yeah. lends more, that lends more credence to it. Mm-hmm. PC Keith Blakelock was assigned on the night to Serial 502, a metropolitan police unit consisting of a sergeant and 11 constables from Hornsley and Woodgreen police stations. A shield serial was a unit equipped with shields, NATO helmets, and a personnel carrier. Expecting trouble, the Metropolitan Police had increased the deployment of these patrols across the capital. The unit arrived at the estate's Gloucester Road entrance in their Sherpa van around 7.45, armed with truncheons and shields, three long riot shields and six round ones. At 9.30pm, David Pengley led the unit onto the estate to protect firemen who had earlier attended a supermarket fire in the Tanmere block, but had been forced out. Tanmere had been built as a ziggurat, with successively reducing levels, with a shopping precinct on a mezzanine, as well as flats and balconies. According to PC Richard Coombs, several men shouted from one of the balconies that the supermarket was on fire, but he feared that it might have been a trap. The firemen made their way back up an enclosed staircase into Tanmere, with Serial 502 behind them. Dozens of rioters suddenly appeared at the top of the stairs, Pengley explained that they were helping the firemen to put out the fire and that they would leave. 
Suddenly, the rioters began blowing whistles, throwing bottles, and hacking at the police shields with machetes. Pengli ordered that the officers and firefighters retreat. They were forced to run backwards down the unlit narrow staircase, fearful of tripping over the fire hoses. PC Coombs, armed with just a short truncheon, recalled that the noise was deafening and he could barely see through the scratched Perspex visor on his helmet. He later said that he could hearly hear the rioters chanting, Kill the pigs. Rioters also appeared at the bottom of the stairs, carrying knives, machetes, baseball bats, bricks, petrol bombs and paving stones. The bombs began exploding, the stones were thrown over the officers' helmets and riot shields were the only defence against the machetes. As the firefighters and police ran out onto the stairwell towards a car park and a patch of grass, one of the firemen, Divisional Fire Officer Trevor Stratford, saw that PC Blakeblock had tripped and fell. He said, he just stumbled and went down and they were upon him. It was just mob hysteria. There are about 50 people on him. The rioters removed PC Blakelock's protective helmet and attacked him. He suffered more than 50 stabbing and slashing injuries, eight of them to his head, caused by weapons that included machetes and a sword. Holy shit. A six-inch long knife was buried into his neck up to the hilt. His body was covered in marks from having been kicked or stamped on. His hands and arms were so badly cut, and he had lost several fingers trying to defend himself. There were 14 stab wounds on his back, one on the back of his right thigh, and six on his face. Stabbing injuries to his armpits had penetrated his lungs. His head had been turned to one side and his jawbone smashed with a blow that had left a six-inch gash across the right side of his head. Did he recover? No, he's d- he's dead. Oh, right. A second group surrounded PC Coombs, who sustained a five-inch long cut to his face, had his neck slit open and was left with a broken upper and lower jaw. A third constable, Michael Shepard, was hit by an iron spike. Shepard collapsed next to PC Coombs and placed his shield over him to protect them both from the crowd who were kicking and hitting them. Several officers and firefighters turned and ran back towards the crowd to try and save PC Blakelock and PC Coombs. Firefighter Trevor Stratford later said, I remember running in with another fire officer to get Dick Coombs. I literally slid into the group like a rugby player charging into a ruck. We dragged him out, but he was in a hell of a state. I then ran back towards Keith Blakelock. Other officers were already there. We were all being hit and beaten, but I managed to get hold of his collar and pull his head and shoulders out of the group. One of the other officers helped me to drag him out. Dave Pengley kept a rearguard barrier between us and the rioters, standing in the middle of it all with just a shield and a truncheon, trying to fend them off, which was an image I'll never forget. Between us all, we managed to manhandle Keith out onto the road and and to safety. He was already unconscious when I got him onto the ground. I started mouth-to-mouth and heart massage on him, but his injuries were just horrific. He had a knife embedded up to the handle in the back of his neck. We could see he had multiple stab wounds and some of his fingers were missing, but we just kept working on him. PC Blakelock was taken by ambulance to the North Middlesex Hospital, but died en route. Following the death of PC Blakelock and the end of the riots, the British press took on a very racist tone. The Sun newspaper compared the Labour leader of Haringey Council, Bernie Grant, who had, who had immigrated from Guyana in 1963, to an ape, Ugh. writing that he had spoken to reporters whilst peeling a banana and juggling an orange. Oh, for fuck's sake. It's nice to see that the sun has hasn't really changed. It's always been yeah. I mean, a I'm, massive pile I'm, of shit. I'm not. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of violence in any way, shape, or form. No. But this didn't come from nothing. This this is you know the same as the mm-hmm. uh, as the LA riots. It's it's an overflow of all the shit that they've been dealt for decades. Yeah, this is a lifetime of being treated as less than dirt, mm. and it all suddenly exploding. And then everyone just, like, blaming their self-control for it. Yeah, well, of course, it has to be the black people who are the problem. Yeah, no way their anger is justified. No, of course not. And, you know, I'm not saying that they're blameless in this, in the sense of, you know, PC Blakelock was murdered brutally and did not deserve that. But it's a hard one because I can see why they did this and I can empathise with why it happened. But at the same time, I don't condone it. And you can also you can also understand how you know when you look at mob psychology how things like that do happen mm. where overkill occurs because everybody wants in on the action. Yeah, well, they were saying there was fifty people on him. It's mm. like people they're probably like, well, I didn't do much, I just kicked him. It's like, yeah, but if fifty people kicked him, that's him beaten to death. You know, it's it's everyone in together. It builds and yeah, that's how you get people murdered in riots because 
it's not just one person doing it it's 50 60 70 people doing it yeah and it's everybody seeing everyone else doing it and going well if they're doing yeah. it it's okay to do it yeah especially when there's so much anger and resentment and you know in their eyes this all started because the police barged into a woman's house for no reason and led to her death it's like of course yeah. they're going to be angry and want some payback and so much catharsis mm. that we had from that from that violence as well again not condoning it but completely no. understandable as a, as a reaction of course yeah so um benny grant caused uproar with his comments after the killing he told reporters that quote the police got a bloody good hiding and maybe it was a policeman who stabbed another policeman However, he later described the violence as inexcusable. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Kenneth Newman, told reporters that groups of Trotskyist and anarchists had orchestrated the violence, a theme picked up by the Daily Telegraph and other papers. Goodness. I'd like to know where he got that one from. (laughs) His butthole! (laughs) Well, of course, it wasn't long-standing issues between the police and local residents. It was the Trotskyists. The anarchists came in and kicked it off. The Daily Express reported on the 8th of October that a Moscow-trained hit squad gave orders as mob-hacked PC Blakelock to death. That's a direct quote. (laughs) From from where? The Daily Express. Oh, right. That bastion of truth. Yeah. Uh, They alleged that, quote, crazed left-wing extremists trained in Moscow and Libya had coordinated the riots. How can you be both crazed and coordinated? It's a fine line. That's why they've yeah. been trained. You need the training, otherwise it's one or the other. Mm. Detective Chief, Chief, Detective Chief Superintendent Graham Melvin of this serious crime squad was placed in charge of the investigation into Blake Lost's death a few hours after the killing at 2 a.m. With 150 officers assigned full time, the inquiry became the largest in the history of the Metropolitan Police. 150 police officers. Yes. To solve a crime that is unsolvable because not one person killed him. Yep. But one of their own died, so they need to get payback. Well, yeah, ex-fucking exactly. Melvin's first problem was that there was no forensic evidence. Senior officers had not allowed the estate to be sealed off immediately after the attack, which meant that the crime scene had not been secured. How do you seal off a crime scene during a riot? Just asking. (laughs) Sorry, sorry, could you just go round? Could you just go round? (laughs) To be fair, it was wrapping up at that point. (laughs) Witnesses and those directly involved had been allowed to leave without giving their names, and objects that might have been that might have held fingerprints had not been collected. Police had not been allowed into the estate in great numbers until four AM, by which time much of the evidence had disappeared. Whatever remained was removed during Haringey Council's clean-up operation. So the council just came in and cleared everything up, including a crime scene. Mm -hmm. So what little could have been there, the one time the council clears up that estate. (laughs) Yeah. Because of this, Melvin resorted to arresting suspects, including juveniles, some of them regarded as vulnerable, and holding them for days without access to lawyers. Genius. Of the 359 people arrested in the connection to the inquiry... Yep. (laughs) 359 people arrested as suspects. Just 94 were interviewed in the presence of a lawyer. Fuck's sake. Many of the confessions that resulted, whether directly about the murder or about having taken part in the writing, were made before the lawyer was given access to the interviewee. So they they get a confession out of them, then they let them talk to their lawyer. Yeah, but I wonder if... Completely above board. I, I wonder if this is before all that due process where, you know... No, you know, because now it would get thrown out as inadmissible. Mm-hmm. You, you'll find out a bit. There's, there's, you know, this is only about halfway through. So oh, goody. questions like that will get cleared up. For you. <laughs> and oh, you are going to have so much faith in the police after this. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I know it's 30 years ago, but oh, Jesus Christ. When people did confess to even a minor role in the rioting, such as throwing a few stones, they were charged with a fray. One resident told the 1986 Guildford Inquiry into the writing, you would go to bed and you would just lie there and you would think, are they going to come and kick my door in? What's going to happen to my children? It was that horrible fear that you lived with day by day, knowing they would come and kick down your door and hold you for hours. Yeah, because they want to inflict as much punishment on as many people as possible. Yep. The Inquiry heard that 9,165 police officers were either deployed onto the estate or held in reserve 
between the 10th and 14th of October. 9,000! Yep. So that 150 got a bit of a boost. The police... (laughs) It's astounding, isn't it? Yeah. The police created, or at least intensified, a climate of fear in which witnesses were afraid to step forward. Really? (laughs) I I can't see why. Backfiring, because that's never happened in history. Melvin, however, defended his decision to hold people without access to legal advice by arguing that lawyers might pass information they had gleaned during interviews to other suspects. Oh, well, at least it wasn't, they're all scum. Mm, That's probably what he was thinking. Mm -hmm. He said, quote, the integrity of some firms of solicitors left a lot to be desired. (laughs) Sorry, I'm sorry, you're you're questioning somebody's integrity? (laughs) Yeah. And I think you jumped the gun there with, at least he's not calling them scum, because that's pretty much saying that. Well, no, no, I was sorry. I meant he, he meant that all the people he arrested were scum, not the liars. Oh, right. He probably thinks both. Yeah. He said he believed solicitors were being retained by people who had an interest in learning what other suspects had said. So he's seeing conspiracies now as well. Yeah, because they're unable to, you know, talk to each other prior to becoming arrested or anything like that. You know what? This guy makes Gene Hunt look like a progressive super cop. (laughs) Fucking hell. Mark Pennant, a 15-year-old boy of West Indian heritage, was arrested on the 9th of October and charged with murder two days later. He was diagnosed with learning difficulties and was attending a special school at the time. Oh, for fuck's sake. Arrested and handcuffed at school, he was taken to Woodgreen Police Station and interviewed six times over the course of two days with a teacher in attendance rather than a lawyer. His mother had not been told he had been taken into custody, and the police reportedly told him that she had refused to help him. (gasps) Mark told the police that he had cut PC Blakelock and kicked him twice, and he named Winston Silcott as the ringleader, and several others, including another juvenile, Mark Lambie. When charged with the murder, he asked his teacher who had accompanied him, does this mean I have to go and live with you? (sighs) That whole, the, 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 sorry, the treatment of, um, oh, yeah, learning disabled people. I mean, like, it, it's one of the reasons why, um, making a murderer is, like, so tragic to me. Because mm. in this country, both of them would not have been allowed to be interviewed on their own because they were both there because the levels of learning disability are, are classed differently in America. And in this country, mm. they would both be classed as learning disabled. It's, so that they turned around to him and said to him, your mother doesn't want to help you. Yeah. It's like any part of that interview should from there on just get thrown out because they tried to terrorise him. And probably coerced a confession out of him. Oh, not probably. Um, definitely. Hmm. I think that's a 100% coerced a confession. The fact that he turned around and said, oh, I'm going to be charged with murder. Does that mean I have to go and live with my teacher? He doesn't know what's going on. Oh, he has no fucking idea. No. that That is them taking advantage of a youth who doesn't understand what's going on and they just want for him to say what they want him to say and they don't give a shit. But that also shows me that they don't actually give a fuck about who killed PC Blakelock. No, they, they've they decided who killed him and they just want to get them now. Yeah, as many as possible. Mm-hmm. Jason Hill, a 13-year-old white boy who lived on Broadwater Farm, was seen looting from a store in the Tanmere block during the riot near where PC Blakelock was killed. He was arrested on the 13th of October and taken to Leighton Police Station, where he was held for three days without access to a lawyer. He reported being kept in a very hot cell, which he said made sleeping and even breathing difficult. His clothes and shoes were removed for forensic tests, and he was interviewed wearing only underpants and a blanket. Holy fuck, he's 13! Yep, three days in those conditions. Jesus. Over the course of several interviews, Jason told police that he had witnessed the attack and named Silcott and others, including Mark Lambie. He described an almost ritualistic killing and said that Silcott, who was nicknamed Styx, had forced him to make his mark on Blakelock with a sword. Jason Hill described inflicting injuries to PC Blakelock's chest and legs that did not match the autopsy report. Later, in 1991, Hill said that throughout the interview the police had said, go on, admit it, you had a stab, and it was Styx, wasn't it? He said they had threatened to keep him in the station for two weeks and said he would never see his family again. Ugh. Quote, they could have told me it was Prince Charles and I would have said it was him. Mm. Mark Lambie, aged 14, was the third juvenile to be charged with murder. 
He was named by Mark Pennant and Jason Hill, and was interviewed with his father and solicitor present. So, well, this this one gets a lawyer, at least. That's an improvement. Mm-hmm. Lambie admitted to having taken part in the writing, but denied involvement in the murder. One witness said that he had seen Lambie force his way through the crowd to reach PC Blakelock, although the testimony was later discredited. The witness was caught in several lies and admitted that he had offered evidence only to avoid a prison sentence. According to a historian, David Rose, a former detective inspector called the Blakelock investigation a pre-scientific injury. It was all about how we get William Silcott convicted, not discovering who killed Keith Blakelock. By the time of the murder, local police saw Silcott as a, quote, biggest mafioso in Tottenham, running the mugging gangs, paying them with drugs. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I did say this one would probably make you angry. Uh. Silcott was 26 years old at the time of the attack and was well known to the police. He told Rose that he had experienced racism throughout his entire upbringing, particularly from the police. After leaving school at 15, he took a series of low-paying jobs and in 1976 began breaking into houses. The following year, he was convicted of nine counts of burglary and sent to Borstal for a few months, and in 1979 was sentenced to six months for wounding. In September 1980, he stood trial for the murder of a 19-year-old Lenny McIntosh, a postal worker who was stabbed and killed at a party in Munswell Hill in 1979. The first trial resulted in a hung jury, but a second trial saw him acquitted. So he's got a bit of a record, but, you know, circumstances forced him into a lot of these situations. And he's also, like, you know, he's one of those people that the police probably assume he got away with murder. They're pissed off that he, that he got acquitted. Yeah, it's like you've been acquitted, but we, we reckon you're still guilty, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's not that you're innocent, it's just you managed to get out of it. Yeah. More convictions followed. In October that year, he was fined for possessing a flick knife, and in March 1984, for obstructing police. In 1985, he made the news when he told Diana, Princess of Wales, who was on an official visit to Broadwater Farm, the one I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. he said, she should not have come without bringing jobs. Yeah. Which The Sun reported as being a threat. What? Yes, they said that was a threat towards her. <sighs> Dear snowflakes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. In December 1984, Silcott was arrested for the murder of a 22-year-old boxer, Anthony Smith, at a party in Hackney. Smith had been slashed repeatedly in the face, and there were two wounds to his abdomen, a lung had been lacerated, and his aorta cut. Silcott was charged with the murder in May 1985, and was out on bail when PC Blakelock was killed. So, like you were saying, any preconceived notions by the police that this guy has gotten away with stuff. He's on bail for another crime, so they, yeah, they just, anything he does, he's instantly guilty in their eyes, I think. Silcott was living in the Martlesham block of Broadwater Farm at the time of the riots, and was running his greengrocer's shop in the Tanmere block, the block near the spot where Blakelock was killed. He said that he had been in Tanmere block on the night of the death, and had stopped someone from throwing a scaffolding pole through the window of his shop. A friend of his had then invited him to her apartment to keep him out of trouble. Quote, I'm on bail for murder. I know I'm stupid, but I'm not that stupid. <laughs> There's helicopters, police photographers everywhere. All I could think about was that I didn't want to lose my bail. Which is a fair assessment. Yeah. <laughs> Shit's kicking off. I'm staying away from it. <laughs> Silcott was arrested for Blakelock's murder on the 12th of October, six days after the riot. He was interviewed five times over 24 hours. Detective Chief Superintendent Melvin asked the questions and Detective Inspector Maxwell Dingle took the notes. During the first four interviews, Silcott stayed mostly silent and refused to sign the detective's notes, but during the fifth interview on the 13th of October, when Melvin said he knew Silcott had struck Blakelock with a machete or sword, his demeanour changed according to the notes. Because this is before they had... Yeah, I was going to say, this is, where, this is where it was all down, you know, what the police said happened. Yep. Which is fucking scary. Oh, yes, you haven't seen half of it yet. The interview notes said he asked, who told you that? When the detective said they had witnesses, he reportedly said, they are only kids, no one is going to believe them. The notes say that he walked around the interview room with tears in his eyes saying, you cunts, you cunts, and Jesus. Then, you ain't got enough evidence, those kids will never go to court, you wait and see. No one else will talk to you, you can't keep me away from them. He was at that point charged with murder, to which he reportedly responded, "They won't give evidence against me." So, so they couldn't get the so they couldn't get the confession. So they made it out like he got threatening instead. Yep, pretty much. 
Silcott was convicted of Smith's murder in February 1986 while awaiting the trial of Blakelock's murder, and was sentenced to life imprisonment. 19-year-old Enid Raghip was arrested on the 24th of October 1985 after a friend mentioned his name to police, the only time anyone had linked him to the murder. He had little connection with Broadwater Farm, although he lived in nearby Woodgreen and had gone to the farm with two friends to watch the riots. One of those friends, John Broomfield, gave an interview to the Daily Mirror on the 22nd of October 1985, boasting about his involvement. When Broomfield was arrested, he implicated Raghip. What a fucking idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> They're arresting everybody. Oh, yeah, I was there. Oh, idiot. Raghip was held for two days without representation, first speaking to a solicitor on the third day, who said that he found Raghip distressed and disorientated. He was interviewed by Detective Sergeant Van Thal and Detective Inspector John Kennedy ten times over a period of four days. He made several incriminating statements, first that he had thrown stones, then during the second interview that he had seen the attack on PC Blakelock. During the third, he said that he had spoken to Silcott about the murder. After the fifth interview, he was charged with a fray, and during the sixth, he described the attack on Blakelock. Quote, It was like you see in a film, a helpless man with dogs on him. It was just like that. It was really quick. He, however, did not sign the interviews. He was held for another two days, released on bail, then charged with murder six weeks later in December 1985. What? Yeah, they're charging him with murder. <laughs> yeah, they're just racking up as many as they can now. Yeah. 18-year-old Mark Braithwaite was arrested on the 16th of January 1986, three months after the murder. His name was mentioned for the first time to detectives by a man they had arrested, Bernard Kinghorn. Kinghorn told them that he had seen Braithwaite, who he said he knew only by sight, stab Blakelock with a kitchen knife. Kinghorn later withdrew the allegation, telling the BBC three years later that it had been false. However... Yeah, but that's three years later, hmm. so doesn't help Braithwaite at the minute. No. He was taken to Enfield Police Station and interviewed. He was held for three days and was first denied access to a lawyer on the instruction of Detective Chief Superintendent Melvin. He's a stand-up guy, Melvin. Yeah. He was interviewed eight times over the first two days, and with a lawyer present four times on the third day. During the first 30 hours of his detention, he had nothing to eat and said in court, as did several other suspects, that the heat in the cells was oppressive, making it difficult to breathe. He at first denied being anywhere near the farm, then during interview four said that he had been there and had thrown stones. Do you know what the, do you know what the sad thing is? Well, all of, you it? Know, all of it. All of this is sad. <laughs> but I just know that this is going to end up with a fuck ton of these people going to prison and the police going, woohoo, we're awesome. Possibly. If it's not, I'll be very surprised. <laughs> During interview five, he said he had been at Tanmere Block, but had played no role in the murder. During interview six, he said he had hit Blakelock with an iron bar in the chest and legs. Oh, so this, but this is just textbook. Like, grinding somebody down until mm -hmm. they admit more and admit more and admit... You know, just say you just say you were doing something. Yeah, I was doing... Yeah. Come on, come on. We know that you were near, near where it happened. Come on, just say that, just say that. Come on, we know... We, we're not gonna we know that you didn't like me to hurt him but you did hit him didn't you interestingly um the wounds he described inflicting uh were not found on the body during the autopsy is that gonna make any difference fuck no in a seventh interview he said he had hit a police officer but that it was not blakelock on the basis of this confession evidence he was charged with murder the trial of the six suspects silcott raghip braithwaite pennant hill and lambie began in court number two of the Old Bailey on the 19th of January, 1987. Three adults, three children. All coerced. All denied due process. Yeah, oh, you don't want due process. Fabricated evidence. All the men were charged with murder, riot and affray. Lambie was also charged with throwing petrol bombs. The jury consisted of eight white men, two black women and two white women. They were not told that it was Silkoff's fourth murder trial and they had been out on bail for the murder of Anthony Smith when Blakelock was killed, or that he had subsequently been convicted of that murder. They're not I don't think that I don't think they're allowed to, are they? Um I'd thought not because that would it's influence the jury. Yeah. But the fact that they mentioned it wasn't brought up, maybe they could at the time. Maybe they could, yeah. I mean if it didn't matter that somebody was held for three days without food, water or representation. Yeah. Yeah, what do they care about influencing a jury? Yeah. 
Silcott's barrister, Barbara Mills, a future director of public prosecutions, decided that he should not take the stand to avoid exposing him to questions about his previous convictions. Although that would actually work in his favour. Yeah, they could try and spin it that way as, yeah, I've done things in the past, but not this, but they're well, just no, because, pinning I mean, everything he said, on me. He said, why would I, why would I be so stupid as to, as to mm. jeopardise my, jeopardise my freedom? The effort to avoid introducing the convictions for the murder of Anthony Smith worked against Silcott. It meant that the jury could not be told that he had signed on for his bail at Tottenham Police Station at around 7pm on the evening of Blakelock's death. This was when witnesses had placed him at Broadwater Youth Association meeting, making inflammatory speeches against the police. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Doesn't shoot holes in all of their witness statements at all. No, or, you know, give him a fucking stone-cold alibi. Yeah. In the view of the prosecution, the killers had intended to decapitate PC Blakelock and place his head on a pole. I have no idea where they got that from, but that's what they told the jury. Well, it's flavour, isn't it? The press coverage for the trial included the publication on day two by The Sun of a notorious close-up of a half-smiling Silcott. Silcott said he'd been asleep in his police cell when it was taken... He said that he was woken up, held in a corridor with his arms pinned against the wall, and photographed, and that his expression on his face was one of fear. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, the, the photo has actually become quite well known now, because it's just, Have you got look at this murderer. Uh, I can bring it up for you, give me a second. Rather than me googling. Yeah, so this is the one where, according to the press, he's he's smiling because he's a murderer, but when he says, no, I was just terrified, you can see the look of fear in his eyes. He doesn't know what's happening to him oh god yeah but no that's the the smirking murder that was plastered on the in the press good old tabloids the judge dismissed the charges against the three youths because they had been detained without access to parents or a lawyer so someone actually knows the law in the absence of the jury the judge was highly critical of both the police on that point the jury deliberated for three days they returned on the 19th of March 1987 with a unanimously guilty verdict against Silcott, Raghip and Braithwaite. <sighs> All three were sentenced to life in prison with a recommendation that Silcott serve at least 30 years. Well, I'm pretty sure in, in England there's something different between... Yeah, gen generally, uh, detention during Her Majesty's pleasure. So generally it's not actually whole life. Mm. To begin with, it was fairly common for those sentenced to life to be released in around 10 to 15 years. As time passed, it came to be thought that longer sentences should be imposed, especially in cases such as the Moores murders, Yorkshire Ripper and Dennis Nielsen. The Home Secretary, now Minister for Justice, was empowered to make whole life orders to ensure that particularly dangerous or heinous criminals were never released. Currently, mandatory life has served an average of 14 years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a whole life order means that they will never be released. Yeah, which is still very rare. But yeah. them recommending that he serve at least 30 years is an extreme yeah unlike america which which throws out life without parole for traffic violations if you're the wrong skin color yep so rose the historian i mentioned earlier wrote that the tabloids knew no restraint writing about the beast of broadwater farm hooded animals and packs of savages and the image of him in the jail cell was published above the caption the smile of evil Ugh. a campaign to three the Tottenham Three, as they had become known, was organised by the Broadwater Farm Defence Campaign. They published an 18-page report in 1997, sorry, 1987 by two American law professors who had attended part of the trial, and who wrote that Silcott's conviction, quote, represented a serious miscarriage of justice. The New Statesman and Time Out wrote sympathetic pieces, and MPs and trade unionists were lobbied. Raghip's solicitor applied for leave to appeal. She began to explore Raghip's mental state, arguing that his confession could not be relied upon, and arranged for him to be examined by specialists in suggestibility. It was concluded that he was unusually suggestible, with a mental age between 10 and 11. So yeah, so he's not unusually su suggestible, he is, he is as suggestible as a 10-year-old. Yeah. Silcott was again represented by Barbara Mills, who noted the lack of photographic or scientific evidence, and argued that Silcott would have been unlikely to stop firefighters from extinguishing a fire on the deck of Tamir Block, given that he was renting a shop there. Mm. Lord Lane, then Lord Chief Justice of England, dismissed the applications for appeal on the 13th of December 1988, arguing of Raghip that the jury had an ample opportunity to form its own opinion of him. Oh, 
What? Amnesty International criticised this decision, pointing to the problems with confessions made in the absence of a lawyer. And also confessions made by somebody who has difficulty understanding even the concept of Mm -hmm. what's being asked of them. Yeah. When when Amnesty International is criticising you, you're doing a shit job as a a legal professional. During a BBC Newsnight discussion, Lord Scalman, a former law lord, said that the convictions ought to be overturned. Another psychologist report was attained about Raghip and supported by Raghip's MP Michael Portillo, asked the Home Secretary to review the case. An application was also submitted to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that the way Raghip had been interviewed breached the European Convention of Human Rights. In December 1990, Home Secretary Kenneth Baker referred Raghip's case back to the Court of Appeal. In parallel to these efforts, Silcott's lawyers had requested access in November 1990 to his original interview notes so that the seven pages from his crucial fifth interview, notes that he said were fabricated, could be submitted for an electrostatic detection analysis. The test can identify a small electrical charge left on a page when the page above it is written on. In this way, the test developers say, the chronological integrity of interview notes can be determined. In Silcott's case, according to the scientist who conducted the test, the notes from the section of the fifth interview in which Silcott appeared to incriminate himself had been inserted after the other notes were written. The seventh and final page of the fifth interview, where the participants would normally sign, was also missing. The test suggested that on the third to sixth page of the interview, no impression had been left from previous pages, although these earlier impressions appeared throughout the rest of the notes. According to Will Bennett in The Independent, the test also revealed an imprint of a different page five from the one submitted in evidence, which was clearly the same interview with Silcott, but in which he made no implicit admissions. An additional forensic scientist said that the paper on which the disputed notes were written came from a different batch of paper from the rest of the interview. So yeah, the, the fake confession. Mm-hmm. Completely bullshit, proven by science. Well done, police. Yep. The disputed section of the interview had been written down by Detective Inspector Maxwell Dingle. It said that when the police told Silcott they had witnesses' statements saying he had attacked Blakelock, he replied, they're only kids, no one is going to believe them. He reportedly said later, those kids will never go to court, you wait and see. As a result of the test evidence, the Home Secretary added Silcott and Braithwaite to Raghip's appeal. The Court of Appeal heard Silcott's appeal on the 25th of November 1991 and took only 90 minutes to overturn the convictions. Wow. Yeah, it was that bullshit a case, it took them an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Raghip and Braithwaite's appeal were heard a few days later and was also swiftly overturned. Braithwaite and Raghip were released immediately. Silcott, however, remained in jail for the 1984 murder of Anthony Smith. He did receive £17,000 in compensation in 1991 for his conviction in Blakelock's case. And in 1995, he was offered up to £200,000 in legal aid to sue the police for conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. The Metropolitan Police settled out of court in 1999, awarding him £50,000 for false imprisonment and malicious persecution. He was released on licence in October 2003, having served 17 years for Smith's murder. A second criminal inquiry was opened in 1992 under Commander Perry Nove, who appealed for help from the local black community. In January 1993, the Crown Prosecution Service drew a distinction between the kickers and stabbers, and decided that the former could be called as witnesses in exchange for immunity from prosecution. (laughs) So if you kicked him, it's all right, we just want the people that stabbed him. Essentially, yes. Kicking good, stabbing bad. They've they've drawn a line. By the end of 1993, Nove had identified nine suspects against whom at least two eyewitnesses could testify, supported by evidence such as photographs. The suspect list include Nicholas Jacobs, who in 2014 would be tried for Blakelock's murder, based on statements gathered during the Nove investigation. 2014? Yes. However, he was acquitted. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It transpired during Jacobs' trial that the two of the witnesses who testified against him had been paid expenses to the tune of £1,000 during the Nove inquiry. Oh my God! They paid for witness statements so they so they so they, oh, so they just did another bullshit investigation yeah they never gave a fuck who actually killed this dude well they've got to get someone so 
do no. what you got to do? No. Oh. In parallel with this second investigation, a case was being prepared against Detective Chief Superintendent Melvin and Detective Inspector Dingle. In July 1992, Melvin was charged with perjury and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, and Dingle with conspiracy. The trial of Detective Chief Superintendent Melvin and Detective Inspector Dingle opened in, in June 1994 at the Old Bainley. Only three people had been present during the disputed interview with Silcott, Melvin, Dingle and Silcott himself, and none of them gave evidence. <laughs> the prosecution alleged that the detective's notes from the fifth interview with Silcott had been altered after the fact to include the self-incriminating remarks. The defence, however, argued that the ESDA test, which suggested that the disputed words had been added to the notes later, was not reliable. The defence also produced 14 witness statements from the two Blakelock inquiries, seven from Nove's 1992-94 inquiry, and seven from the original investigation in 1985, which were read out to the jury. Several of the statements originated from the juveniles who'd been arrested shortly after the murder. The detectives were acquitted on the 26th of July 1994 by a unanimous verdict. <sighs> you didn't expect the police to have to answer for this, did you? No. Both had been suspended during the case. Dingle retired immediately, and when Melvin returned, he was greeted as a hero at work and retired three months later. On full pension. A third investigation into Blakelock's murder was launched in 2003, with 10,000 witness statements taken and items submitted for forensic tests. Holy fuck! Despite these tests, no forensic evidence was found that could prove useful. I wonder how much that cost. Oh, a lot. Six years later, a number of suspects would be arrested, but no action was taken against them due to lack of evidence. Nicholas Jacobs, who was 16 years old at the time of the riot, was charged with Blakelock's murder in 2013 and was remanded in custody. He pleaded not guilty. Jacobs was living with his mother in Manor Road in Tottenham at the time of the riot. He was named shortly after the riot by two of those arrested and was arrested himself five days later, quote, in connection with the murder of PC Blakelock. The police had photographs of him from the night carrying a petrol bomb, a basket of rocks and a crate. He told them he had first arrived at the estate after midnight, two hours after Blakelock was killed. He said that he had been at home during the attack. He was charged with a fray, and in November 1986, he was sentenced to eight years. Now, I'm going to skip over to... I didn't put this in my notes, but it's... I'm going to include this. One of the um, pieces of evidence they brought against him during his trial in 2014 was evidence they found in his prison cell, which was rap lyrics that he'd written down. This is what he wrote. Me have the chopper, we have intention to kill, and police officer, PC Blakelock, the unlucky fuck, him dis and help the fireman. Who did an out and fire the fireman, we have come and decide to scatter, but PC Blakelock, him never smell the danger. But when we fly down upon him, he start, scream and holler, everybody gather round and have pure laughter. He tried to head out, but we trip him over. He start to beg for mercy, but it don't matter. Him try to play Superman and him get capture. Him and we have faced the consequences. We chop her, we start chop him on his hand, we chop him on his finger, we chop him on leg. We chop him on his shoulder, him head, him chest, him neck, we chop him all over. When we done, kill him off. Lord, feel much better. Me just wipe off me knife and go check on daughter. We sit down and talk. She cook me dinner. So that's what they took to court as part of the evidence. And... This is one of the best things I, I've seen as a legal defence. His, uh, his uh, lawyer, Courtney Griffith, turned around and said, Bob Marley had not been prosecuted for I shot the sheriff. <laughs> he was found not guilty in a 10-2 verdict. Well, I mean, if the police are bringing in as evidence, we found these rap lyrics. Yeah. They really don't have shit, do they? No, no. It, <laughs> oh, they, they had nothing. And it's nearly 30 Again. it's like 30 years later and it's like the best they can do is this guy once wrote some rap lyrics about the murder of blake lock it must have been him mm -hmm. the investigation has received criticism for failing to collect physical evidence using fear and intimidation to influence confessions from suspects the fabrication of evidence 
and failure to adhere to the law. During part to the police handling of the investigation, none of the men responsible for the killing of PC Blakelock have ever been found. And never will be. No. And uh, I just... I, I, I learnt about this from uh, a documentary series. Mm. Crimes that shook Britain. And I'd never heard mm. of it before. And we, we ended up going through like three, four seasons of this show. It was great. And yeah, one of the things I've seen several times on that is... As far back as the 70s and 80s, police have been fabricating evidence. They decide who they want to be responsible and they are faking shit. And this one here oh, is one yeah, of the most yeah, yeah. public and insane attempts I've seen at it. And I don't know how they keep getting away with this shit. One of, one of the most, you know, the difference between a good cop and a bad cop is a good cop follows the clues to where they lead and the bad cop finds a suspect and then makes the clues fit that suspect. Mm-hmm. The thing is, us in the UK, we see, we look at what goes on in America and the police brutality there and people of colour being killed and we think, you know, we're doing so much better. Our, our police officers are so much better than this, but they're not. They just don't have guns. Mm. So they don't just kill these suspects. They make up shit trials like this. Yeah. And they torture children to get confessions. Mm-hmm. It makes me fucking angry. And it just, and it just, and, but the thing that just angers me is it's like, it's like you can't you can't tell me that you give a fuck about who killed PC Blake Clark. No. After all of that, not one person wanted to do it right. Not one person had any had any um, want for justice. No. They did not give a fuck about getting justice. They just they just cared about getting revenge. Yeah, and of targeting Silcott. So like, this is a yeah. guy who we think's bad, and we don't want him on the streets. Let's pin it on him. Mm-hmm. Did Silcott ever talk about the murder that he was convicted of? Um, I'm sure he did because he he's been out for a number of years now, and I I know that they've done a number of like documentaries and looks at this this trial. So I'm sure he must have talked about his past and stuff. But I've I've not seen it. I've I've only looked at a couple of bits, and honestly, I didn't look at the other murder conviction too closely because for me it, it played no part in this. It's like he may have been convicted of murder, but that doesn't make it shouldn't make a difference oh, yeah, to this case, yeah. so I didn't look at it. So In 1989, the London School of Economic Students Union elected Silcott as honorary president. Yeah, he, he turned it down, if I remember correctly. Oh, OK. Silcott served 18 years imprisonment for the murder of boxer and nightclub bouncer Tony Smith, friend of notorious underworld figure Ray Barton, for which he was on bail when Blake Clock was killed. Silcott claimed that he killed Smith in self-defence right. after an altercation in which Barton, a boxer himself with a reputation for extreme violence, was also wounded. Silcott, fearing for his life, said he had no choice but to attack. Fair enough. Yeah. So even if people turn around and go, well, he's already killed someone, it's like self-defence. In 2005, the police recruited Silcott to run a youth centre on the Broadwater Farm estate. Hmm. Wow. It all stands, you know. I, I remember from this documentary I was watching, he was involved in the youth centre that was there at that time already. So I think it was a case of, mm-hmm. he, he from how they made out, he wanted to make sure that the, the kids from Broadwater Farm had better opportunities than he did and tried to avoid some of the pitfalls he fell into with his past. So I'm not surprised to find out that he's working with the youth there today. Very interesting. Following a major redevelopment programme, crime rates dropped dramatically and the burglary rate was virtually 0% in 2005. It is one of the most ethnically diverse locations in London. In 2005, its official population of 3,800 including re- included residents of 39 different nationalities. In June 2018, following tests conducted after the Grenfell Tower fire, Haringey Council announced hundreds of families would have to be evacuated because 11 of the towers are at risk of catastrophic collapse in the event of fire. At least two may have to be demolished. One of the um, interesting parts of that documentary, um, if, if yourself and listeners are interested, is they actually speak to um, the other members of Blake Lock's unit who were there, mm. and they actually talk on camera about the experience. One of the guys, he, he still literally got the scars across his face where he was hacked with machete and it, it's it's one of he talk about how how he feels about the justice that was not served or does he not comment on that it was never featured so if they talk to them about that they might refuse to answer if they brought it up with them i think you know well, it's, it's something that i imagine police officers wouldn't want to talk about 
Mm. Plus, these guys are in the difficult situation of they they were victims of horrific violence during the event as well. Yeah. So the interviewer may not have thought it appropriate to bring it up with them because some of these guys, even though it happened thirty years they ago, they they they, they, they still have, have well. yeah, and they still have psychological trauma from it. You could see it in them, and they say that they still wake up at night in fear because of what happened. It's like it's yeah, it's PTSD. Yeah, and it's. This is when I think the a lot of people would look at the Broad Water Farm riots and every and the death the death of Blakelock and be like, it's pretty cut and dry. These people went mad and went out of control and they broke law. It's like, but this is why I included the stuff at the beginning about the increase of the black population in the UK and how police clash with them because these kind of things they don't happen in a vacuum. There's there's a cause for it and it's normally something really institutional and so ingrained in these people's lives that people who aren't people of colour don't see this kind of stuff and don't realise it goes on because it doesn't affect them. But And it, it still happens today. Anytime there's big confrontations like this, it's it might be one event that kicked it off, but there's other stuff there that built it up. And no one in this was innocent, but a lot of these people were victims themselves. Yeah, it's, it's you know, human beings are incredibly short-sighted mm. in individuals. And, you know, so many things, you know, the the people fleeing Central America. That's the United States' fault. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people don't seem to... Like, nothing happens in a vacuum. Mm. Yeah. People don't seem to give people... Um, I, 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 I don't want to get too far into into this because it's getting late. Um, but the whole shimmy the begum thing, mm. um, it's a very, very long... It's a very, very, very long debate. But people's reactions to that has... Uh, upset me a great deal mm. well sorry to have given you a bit of a depressing one your first one back that's but all right i i found this a very interesting case i've never heard of this event and it's still one of the biggest riots in the uk that they've ever had and the, the the legal mess that came out of it with the trials it is so fascinating but mm. 30 years later are, are we that different from where we were then no well on that depressing note shall we shall we wrap things up <laughs> oh um, normally I'd go into my closing spiel here and tell people about our social media and, and things like that. And we will come up to that, but there's something else I'm going to be talking about as well. I've mentioned in the past how this podcast has been in a large part inspired by another podcast that I listen to and love, which is The Dollop. And briefly spoke to the host of that, Dave Anthony, on social media about a project he's launched, which is really important and that I wasn't really paying attention to before, but I think it needs coming up, is the planet's not doing well. <laughs> um, and The planet's doing fine. <laughs> um, is it? Um, well, we fucked it. Here's the thing. When everyone talks about, when everyone talks about the fact that the planet is going to die in 10, year, in 10 years' time, which is true, by the way, um, the planet's going to recover. But we Humanity won't. Humanity will be wiped out. Yeah. Um, yeah, scientists have said we, we've got 10 years to fundamentally change the way we do things and that's scientific fact you know it's if you don't believe in global warming fuck off you're an idiot it's it's not yeah. a debate things need to to be different and it is scary and thinking about it and talking about it is is worrying and off-putting which is why i didn't really want to start thinking about it but thanks to dave anthony and the dollop it, it i listen to it at the end of every podcast there and again i'm, I'm copying them i'm going to talk about it here they we have to do stuff it's the end of February and we've we've got high temperatures and sunshine mm. and I saw people out in shorts and t-shirt eating ice cream the other day and they're talking about how nice the weather is. It's not, the weather isn't nice. We're fucking dying. Yeah. This time last year we had snow. It snowed in Hawaii for the first time ever and it, it needs to be different. We can't do this and it's big and it's going to take loads of people to do it. So Dave Anthony has launched a group called Planet Change 10. Uh, plan it change three separate words um, the idea is to get people together in their own communities and form groups uh, these groups can meet in person or online or a combo of the two and talk about these problems and the fears they have around it they want to get artists and communicators put into art to be used online in the real world what will hopefully have an impact and and spread because we need to make a difference because studies have shown that people shut down when they learn about climate change and that's that's understandable because it's gigantically scary but we're not going to change it just on our own we need to make 
the big corporations change, the governments change, and that's what it's about at Planet Change 10. So if you're worried about your future or your kids' futures or the futures of your friends' kids, because chances are they're going to be living in hell when they're older, go to their Twitter, which is at Planet Change 10, or their Facebook page, and look at what this is like. Start talking about this and, and try and start doing something, because it's like Han said, the planet will bounce back, but we won't. I have two things to add to that. Yeah. One, cheerfully, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos her, are sneakily, well, not so sneakily, um, actually creating rocket ships because their plan is to just, like, get all the billionaires off planet when it... They reckon in 10 years' time they'll have an escape hatch, basically, for the really, really super rich. Yeah. and Which is cheap. And it's those fuckers that are causing the problem, the super rich. Yeah, absolutely, because they, yeah, they give no fucks. Which is why we need to do things to make a change, because it's not, you know, you can recycle all your household waste all you want, and it, it makes a difference, but a tiny difference. It's the big companies yeah. who dump tons of rubbish and cause pollution. They're the ones who are killing the our race, and those are the ones that need to change. Yeah. It's like, you can, you can ban plastic straws, in restaurants if you want but that's less than one percent of the plastic in the ocean it's the big companies who are doing the other 99 those are the people you have to get over and they're the people who don't give a fuck because they've got money they're either going to get the fuck out of here or they're going to die before it affects them Mm -hmm. so you know like people said governments need to fear the people not the other way around so go out there and scare these fuckers show them that people are terrified and that they are not going to put up with it and make them make this change I have no affiliation with this group, but if you're more interested in direct action, uh, there's a group called Extinction Rebellion, who they shut down one of the main bridges in London about a month ago as a protest, and they have lots of uh, local groups and local meetings as well. So Yeah, um, yeah I'm going to be bringing this up every episode now, and I'm, I'm not going to stop talking about this, because it's, it's important, and people need to to come together about this so please go and check out these groups do something because we we have to do it together it's the only way yeah we are we are facing an extinction level event and we are the people we are the threat of extinction well um other than that if you enjoyed this episode uh you can go and find us on social media we've got a twitter and instagram which are both at eccentric underscore earth uh facebook is www.facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth if you want to write into us uh, for feedback or suggestions for future topics you'd like to see us cover our email address is eccentric earth at outlook.com we're on all major podcast providers and youtube so please subscribe so you don't miss an episode and if you enjoy the show leave us a review uh, we're also part of the Brit Pod Scene Network, which has dozens of amazing British podcasts, so go and check them out to discover some great new shows. Han, is there anything you would like to promote or any social media you'd like to plug? Um, the only thing I would like to plug on my own behalf is a little little website and Facebook page called Donite, donite.org, or just search for Donite on Facebook. That's D-O-N-I-T-E. Um, it's a social enterprise that my brother and I have set up. And basically, when you book a holiday through Donite, so you basically you go onto the website and you then click onto any of the price comparison hotel websites and you put do a booking. That money that would normally go to the page owner we are going to be giving to charity. We have a number of charities that you can pick pick from. We are currently raising money for a neonatal unit in Gloucester. Also, the Samaritans. I should probably know this. Uh, Trees for Cities, which plant trees in cities. Music for All, which provides teaching and instruments for low-income kids and disabled disabled kids. And there's probably some more that I that I should know, but I can't remember. So the next time you're booking a hotel, please think of us and uh, help out some of your favourite charities. And it won't cost you any more than it would to just go to the go to the site and book normally. There is no added cost. That's d o n i t e dot org. That's awesome. I I remember you saying you were going to be doing that. I'm glad to hear it's it's up and running because that's an amazing idea. It's my. It was my. Uh, it was my brother's idea. So thank, thank him for his um, awesome brain. He just recruited me to do all the writing. Good, but no, that's something that will make a big difference for a lot of people. And yes, it should. It should be supported. 
Mm-hmm. And it really doesn't cost you any extra than it than it would to book a hotel any other way because it's all the commission that the travel agent normally gets mm. that is uh, where we're getting the the money from. Excellent. Well, thank you for um, coming back on the show, Han. It's it's always always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for listening, and we will see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Bye.